Thank you, Mr. Khan, for having accepted to be with us today, even not in person, to send your message to the symposium organized by the PhD program Draco of the University La Sapienza of Rome. So it's a great pleasure for me to give the word to you now. Oh, it's a great pleasure to uh, be with you. I wish I were there in person. The title, I think, is, is uh, Roma, the Khan Legacy, yes? I think it's wonderful that you're doing this, uh, this symposium because Rome meant the world to my father. It was yeah. so important to him on so many levels. Rome is the inspiration. It is the source. It's so, so in many ways, it's, uh, it's the Rome legacy you're looking at. And it's what Louis Kahn was able to draw from Rome. Looking at this now is really, it's really wonderful. It's been um, nearly 40 years since he died. And throughout his entire life, uh, Rome was always a place that he returned to in person. And he wrote wonderful postcards to, and letters to people that he cared about, uh, to his children, um, to the, the people who were close to him in his life, to his office associates. Um, but he also took, made, made many drawings when he was in Rome. He was trained in the Beaux-Arts, which really sort of suddenly maybe wasn't all that useful. It was, it was always very important to him, but he knew he wanted to be a modern architect. And what did that mean? So he was seeing things, he was seeing uh, the work that was coming out of, out of Europe. Um, he certainly was seeing the work of, early work of Corbusier, seeing the work of Mies van der Rohe. Um, how, do you, how do you put together this architectural sort of response that he's having to the architecture of, of Italy, how do you put that together with modern architecture? And he really couldn't do it, he couldn't figure it out, it wasn't working for him. Uh, but he knew he wanted to try. So I think that, you know, he rattled around for a, for a number of years doing very good work, but really not being able to find his own architectural voice, let's put it that way. Yeah. And for an artist, finding your voice is everything. For my father, always as a teacher, he needed to talk ideas out. He couldn't just sit down like, say, Corbusier or even Frank Lloyd Wright and just sort of, you know, come out with something in his head working it out. Lou needed to talk. An architect in residence meant he needed to take people around to Rome and show them what mattered to him. And that was actually enormously helpful to him because, in fact, I've spoken to a number of people who met him there. And in the middle of the night, he grabbed them and he'd say, uh, let me show you my Rome. Yeah. And they go out in the middle of the night, you know, this was, you have to remember, 1950, 1951. Uh, this was not that long after World War II. This is the era of yeah. your wonderful Italian neorealist cinema. Yeah. So the world of Rome Open City of Rossellini is only five years past. This is the era of um, Bicycle Thief is yeah. coming out in 1948. So we have a Rome that's pretty gritty. I mean, Rome's a little gritty right now. It's changing, but that's a different Rome. It was pretty rough and tumble. And, you know, I didn't really understand what that was like until I arrived myself in Rome for the first time when I was 30 years old. It's very oh. embarrassing to go that late in life, but yeah. I was 30 years old, and I, I arrived in Rome in the middle of the night. But I walked through Rome, the streets at night, without a map, and suddenly I came upon there in the middle of the night, Colosseum, at the end of the street. Wow. It took my breath away. I said, my God, it's the Colosseum. It's right there. That's a tip. Roman experience, that you wander through these streets and suddenly, boom, there's this thing right yeah. in front of you. It's a surprise, constantly surprising you. And you find that, of course, we'll get ahead of ourselves, but you find that constantly in my father's architecture. He loves to surprise you with something. He loves that moment when you come around the side of a corner and suddenly you say, wow, yeah. you know. Um, that is something that I think very much, he found a great resonance in Rome. But so, here we are back in 1950. He hasn't done any of the work that he is most remembered. Um, and I think that it, it was those months that really unlocked, that gave him his voice, that unlocked something in him very, very deep. It was there already. I don't want to imply that he didn't know what he was doing until he arrived at Rome then. But something clicked when he was there in 5051. There's a particular drawing, and I hope to show it. It's now in the collection of the Archives of the University of Pennsylvania. Yeah. It's up the uh, Piazza Cappadoglio. And to me, we've, Bill Whitaker and I, the, the archivist at Pat, have tried to figure out exactly the day he might have done that. We think it was around, it was when he returned after going to uh, Greece and Egypt, comes back to Rome, seeing the ancient world, about to go home, and he goes to Campadocia. We think it might have even been around his birthday in 1951, 
So he would have been 50 years old, February 20th, and he goes to the Capitoglio, and he draws this marvelous, beautiful poem. It's very free. Yeah. It has enormous architectural information in it, but it's also a piece of art. So what I would say, what I like to think of is, on that day, the artist Louis Kahn and the architect Louis Kahn yeah. become one of them. They become the same. So I think that that moment, that drawing in particular, marks an absolutely crucial moment. Rome was a place where Louis would like to say um, that no man can do what time. And Rome is a place that constantly reminds you of time. Time is there right in front of you. Rome is always conscious of its past. That's not just an ancient past. It's an ancient past, it's a prehistoric past, it's an evil past, it's, it's the past of the 19th century, of the 20th century, it's all there, written on the streets, the buildings. Yeah. You're constantly aware of time. Time in architecture was something very much that my father was after. Yes, he had to make timeless monuments, sure. That, that's kind of easy. That's an easy way to put it. It's actually time itself that he was at. This feeling of, I am a human being, I exist for a certain period of time. But these buildings are reminding me of the continuum of all time. And also of the shortness of my own life, the challenges of my own life, the fact that I pass in through one, one window and out the other like a swallow, like a bird flying. And then I'm gone. Um, that's not a depressing thing. It's an inspiring thing. It yeah. makes you want to do better in the time that you have. So I think that's something that he drew very powerfully from Rome, the sense that, that architecture at its best is really about time. It needs to capture time. The other one that I think is extraordinarily important, if you look at my father's Roman drawings, there are very few of buildings themselves. Most of them are of piazzas. He was most interested in the spaces between buildings. And the spaces that were created by buildings, uh, yeah. and the way you would move in between buildings, enormously important to him. And as he once said in Philadelphia, more than anything else, he wanted to design the basis on which buildings would be built, even more than the individual buildings, which is kind of surprising for a guy who built really good buildings. He wanted to design the basis on which other buildings. I think that those ideas come from Rome. Or they certainly could come from Rome, or they're certainly worn out in Rome, in the sense that here he is when he's there, he was drawing especially interested in piazzas, which doesn't mean he didn't draw the buildings around them, but you know, those beautiful Siena drawings also. Um, yeah. You know, uh, same thing, Sample. Sample. Drawing, drawing the piazzas. Because those are where the people come together, but it's also where the buildings are talking to each other, and the buildings are interacting with each other, and a good city is a society of buildings. As he would say, a good building is a society of rooms. And certainly for him, the dream was to design a city. He wanted to do that in Philadelphia. He had that map of Rome behind him as an inspiration. He didn't succeed in Philadelphia. And he actually was able to, in a sense, build cities. Um, and one in Dhaka, Bangladesh, and one in Ahmedabad, in, in India. They really are little cities. And I think that both of those places draw heavily on his experiences. Um, in Philadelphia, for sure, which was a wonderful city, but also his experiences in Rome. Well, he would certainly tell me about Rome as a little boy and how wonderful it was and how he wanted to take me there someday. There were many some days with Lou, you understand. Yeah. Architecture was uh, number one. But he would send back wonderful letters to my mother and postcards to me from all over the world, from throughout the life that I, you know, was with him, which was 11 years. Um, and some of those letters are extraordinarily revealing about how important Rome was to him. He has very little time. He's on the way to somewhere else. He's on the way, I think, out to Dhaka. And he went to the Baths of Caracalla, which was a place he absolutely adored. And he writes about how difficult it was for him now because he's remembering what it was like in 1950 when he saw these for the, really the first time really saw them. Yeah. Now a lot of life has gone by. He's kind of doing what he wanted to do then. And in the letter, there's this longing for a time before 
he was doing it all. Okay. He's missing the moment of, aha, I got it. To him, that was the most important moment, the most exciting moment. But when you have this anticipation of the things that might be, that's the greatest moment of all. Because that's really the moment of artistic realization. And those are words he used again and again. Realization, inspiration. Um, there's a real love for that. Before you've built anything, before you've even put a line on paper, the feeling that's inside. So I think that from that letter, and I may have the date wrong, it's, some, it's somewhere in the mid, in the mid to late 60s, but that feeling is so captured in that letter that Rome to him always had this this, this place in his heart, and especially the Baths of Caracalla and, and of course the Pantheon, yeah. especially those two places. A place in his heart which was really as if, this is my soul. This is where I realized who I could be. Not even who I am, but yes, who I am, but also who I could be. So when he writes that letter, there is this wonderful sense of longing for being a young architect again, relatively young, 50 years old, but for an architect that's young. Yeah. And I can say that for your for your seminar, for the people who are sitting there, for the students sitting there, hold on to those moments. You don't have to know what it is you're going to do. You just have to feel it. And I think that in some on some level, that's maybe the greatest lesson that Lou can pass on to other architects. Sure, you learn a lot from his actual buildings. But learn from his courage to take that little spark, that little feeling that he had when he first visited those ruins and said, there's something here that's really important that I need to get at. I don't know how to do it yet, but I feel it. I feel it. And I'm going to follow that feeling for the rest of my life. That's the best thing that a young person, a visitor to that seminar, who's a young architect, I think can take away from my father his love for Rome. The Pantheon is kind of easy to understand why why he would love it. I mean, who doesn't love the Pantheon? Yeah. You know, um, it's just uh, on so many levels, it's 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 just a genius building. Yeah. <laughs> on so many levels. But but you know, why, why the Baths of Caracalla? Why why are they so important? I mean, I think there are a bunch of reasons. Uh, there is for sure the feeling of ancientness there. Because they're extensive, the ruins. I mean, it's such a marvelous complex of rooms and such. But I think he especially loved a couple of things he loved. He certainly loved the brickwork. Yeah. And the brickwork, actually, there's a there's a lot to be said about the comparison between the brickwork of Rome and the brickwork of Philadelphia. There's a There was an enormous familiarity there for him. The brickwork of the Philadelphia factory was spectacular. And the Philadelphia, the, the, the stadiums, you know, the stadium that was built... Um, uh, the Spania Stadium, beautiful brickwork. But the factory buildings, just the simple factory buildings, are beautifully made, beautifully designed. Um, many of them very complex. I mean, they're not they're not simple forms. They're not just American boxes. These are these are good buildings. Um, and the world he grew up in, in Northern Liberties, had many many of these factories. So he was surrounded constantly, walking through the streets as a little boy, yeah. going to school, yeah. walking along brick walls. Brick walls were his, that was his world. Also as a boy who was burned, he was very shy. And there was sort of this memory, he used to say, that he would slink along the brick walls. You know, people wouldn't see him. So brick was something, was cold against your face, it felt good. But also he was close to brick as a little boy. And you don't get better brickwork than you get at the Baths of Caracalla, the beautiful, those arches and such. Um, but there's something else there, too, and he used to talk about this, which was, if you look at the, some of the main chambers, they're enormous, huge. And he said, well, one way to think about it is, a man who takes a shower in a room that's 50 feet high, it's also about inspiring a human being to be bigger than what you are today. And what more sort of, in a sense, more mundane function than taking a shower, that even when you're taking a shower, you can be made to feel like a bigger person. Um, and of course then, how can you not also realize the irony that this is a guy who loved the Baths of Caracalla, a shower, 
a glorified bathroom. And where does my father die? In the most awful bathroom in Penn Station, New York, which is the ugliest, it's the antithesis yeah. of the Paths of Paracom. So, so to me, when I go to Rome, I visit those, that place especially, the Baths, to stand where my father stood and try to feel that feeling that you're a much bigger guy if you get to take a shower in a 50-foot room. And he's totally right. <laughs> I've never done it myself, Fun but I'd like to. Uh, so I think that the things, the basic realizations that he made about the importance of Rome um, are, anybody can make them. It's that there's something there that is profoundly about how human beings dwell on the planet. There's something very, very profound there. And if you're attuned to it, and you're looking and you're listening, and you're feeling, you'll see it in your own way. 